babies have a very powerful impact, especially on first-time parents. When you have a little baby and you hold that baby in your arms, it is a very awe-inspiring thing. And to watch what happens in a baby's life as what started out as someone who couldn't speak or do much of anything starts to move around a little bit, to respond, to roll over, to crawl. These are all wonderful events, and they uh, fill us with wonder. And that's part of the appeal of Christmas, is, again, just to think about a baby, and in particular, one very special baby. But it's not just a, a love and a sense of amazement at a baby that is what really inspires us at Christmas. It's ultimately the fact revealed in the Bible that the Word became flesh, that this baby was not just one more amazing newborn who started out simply from the love of a parent and where there was nothing, there was another thinking, living human being. That is a, an amazing thing in and of itself. But this baby, this baby is especially astonishing. And so let's hear again what the Lord revealed through the Apostle John about the Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not understood it. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. From the fullness of His grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have focused on that revelation that Jesus Christ is fully God. And when we realize who the Word, the Eternal Son, is, then we need to think again about what it means that He became flesh and tabernacled among us, dwelt among us. In John 1, verse 14, there's a word, eskenosen, which means tented or tabernacled. And a, a brief moment later, there's a reference to what happened through Moses and then what happened through Jesus Christ. And we have a comparison of the coming of Jesus Christ with the tabernacle and also a contrast with the tabernacle. Jesus was in some ways like the tabernacle who tented among us, but different and better. When you think about the tabernacle, it was in some ways a sign and a token of God's presence among the people. God told how this tabernacle was to be built. He told about the things that were to be in it. The inmost room was the most holy place or the holy of holies. And within that most holy place, the holy of holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was a gold box with angels, cherubim on it. And on it was called something called the mercy seat. And this, this tabernacle and the holy of holies and the ark was how God showed his presence among the people. And above the tabernacle there was this great cloud by day and a pillar of fire 
by night. And it was a wonderful way that God showed the people of Israel that he was with them. The tabernacle was, in a sense, God with us. And yet, God with us in ways that were not always beneficial to the people. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, went into the Holy of Holies with fire they weren't supposed to bring in, and they were immediately struck dead. Nobody could enter the Holy of Holies except the high priest. And the high priest could not go in whenever he wanted. He could go in one time a year bringing blood, and that was it. Nobody could touch the ark. Literally, you were barely supposed to touch the ark with a 10-foot pole. There were rings on the ark, and they would have these long poles that if they had to move the ark, they would put through those rings so that nobody ever touched it. The ark was not a very safe thing. The Israelites thought they could just use the ark as a battle weapon. How did that work out? They brought the ark into battle when the wicked sons of Eli were the priests and 30,000 Israelites were killed and the wicked sons of Eli were themselves killed and the ark was captured. But of course the enemies had no right to take the ark so the idol fell down and was smashed. The enemies, the Philistines were getting sick and they wanted to get rid of that ark. Later on, when they got the ark back into Israel, some of the men of the town of Beth Shemesh thought, ooh, the ark, haven't ever seen that before. Wouldn't it be cool to go over to it and touch it and look inside it? And so a group of them got around the ark, this presence of God among them, and they opened it, and immediately 70 of them died. They were just killed instantly by touching and looking into the ark. When King David was bringing the ark to Jerusalem to the temple, they were carrying it or transporting it in a way they weren't supposed to on a cart with an ox. They weren't using the long poles to carry it. And one of the oxen stumbled and Uzzah reached out to steady the ark and the instant he touched it, he was struck dead. That's what God's presence and tabernacling among the people tended to do. It was like being around something with a million volts. And if you got too close, you were instantly fried. The presence of God is, in some respects, a terrifying thing. And the people who had the tabernacle were, in some ways, a blessed people, but also a people who were always living in very close proximity to great danger, because when God tabernacled among the people of Israel, um, his presence was an overwhelming and terrifying thing. God at the tabernacle would appear in a certain sense and yet always hide himself in a cloud and always confine himself within that holy of holies where almost nobody could ever approach. God gave the tabernacles a place where people's sins could be dealt with, where in a sense they could be redeemed from those sins, but not really because the blood of bulls and goats could never take away the sins. God came near to them in the tabernacle, and yet, not so near, always at a distance. Only a few select people could even approach this tent of meeting to be with God. God formed a people, and yet those people were always rebelling and Whatever God was doing among them and through the tabernacle, it didn't seem to have the full impact that it needed to have. God would come to the people and reveal himself through the tabernacle, and yet he was often a God who still seemed at a distance and very deadly for sinful people to approach. And so there was a wonderful thing that God had not just hidden himself in the heavens, that he did come down, that he did choose a people, that he did dwell among them, but he came as a consuming fire, and the people always had to keep a very respectful distance. You remember at, the, at Mount Sinai when the commandments were given, Moses was trembling with fear, and the people, after God had spoken, said, well, don't speak to us anymore, just please talk to Moses. And have him tell us what you say, because if you speak to us, we'll die. So God would come near 
and he would speak, and people tended to be filled with dread and to want to flee. And when someone else, actually not someone else, the same person in a different way came and tabernacled among us and came as a baby, now this was an astonishing thing. When Jesus came, he was really human. When we, when we look at the Old Testament, there's what the theologians call a theophany, an appearance of God. The angel of the Lord, it's sometimes called the angel of the Lord, who was really the Lord himself coming in a human form. He'd appear in a physical shape or a vision, but he would not really become flesh or take on a human nature. He would just kind of show up in a shape or in a vision they could see to communicate with them, and then he would vanish. And he never really did become the man he appeared to be when he came to Abraham and talked with him in the form of a man. He wasn't a human. He was God taking a human shape. When he spoke on Sinai and, and the elders and Moses went up, it says they saw God and ate and drank, but they didn't really see God. It says what they saw was kind of like a blue pavement and um, they didn't really see God himself at all. Ezekiel has a vision, and then at the end of the vision, he says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He doesn't say, I saw God, this is what he looked like. He said, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He's still at many removes from really seeing God. And, and when they would see God, it was very overwhelming, and at the same time, it wasn't even God showing himself. Because God said, nobody can see me and live. So theophanies were a way that God would kind of adapt himself or make a quick video clip, if you will. I don't want to speak too irreverently, but he would not really come. That was not really, he's, God isn't really a cloud. God isn't really a pillar of fire. And at that time, God was not really a man when he, when he would appear. He came as a theophany, a God appearance. But in the incarnation, something different happened. God the Word, the second person of the Trinity, the Yahweh of the Old Testament, joined himself to a real human nature. And he became flesh in that little baby. And Jesus has not just human flesh, which is kind of the lowest aspect of humanity, though still a wonderful and created aspect of humanity, but he has a human soul. He's completely human, as human as you or I, and not seeming to be human or just taking on a temporary appearance for a little while and then going away. Now, that was an old heresy called Gnosticism that Jesus just seemed to be human, but he really wasn't. And when he went back to heaven, then he didn't have a body or even the appearance of a body anymore. Jesus is human and forever remains human with a human soul and a human body. And at the same time, remains God. Now this is a mystery beyond our understanding, but it's telling us that when he became flesh and tabernacled among us, he did something unlike anything he had ever done in Old Testament times. Those were just little sneak previews of the real deal to come when he really became a human being. The Word became flesh. Not just in the tabernacle with that holy of holies and that terrifying million volt Ark of the Covenant, but a baby that people could actually touch. You didn't have to come to him and touch him with a ten foot pole and live in fear that a touch would be fatal. His mother could hug him in her arms and nurse him at her breast. This one who touches the mountains and they smoke, who looks at the earth and it melts, could be touched and hugged. The word became flesh. And no words of mine, not even any words of scripture, can fully express what happened when the word became flesh. 
one of the great attempts of the church to explain, or at least to state this, if not explain it, is the Nicene Creed. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, made man. That is the marvel and, and the mystery of Christmas. Why did the Word become flesh? Well, He became flesh for four reasons that I want to highlight today from the Scriptures. To reveal, to redeem, to relate, and to remake to remake all of humanity. He became flesh to reveal. John 1 says, The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The true light that gives light to every man, that's who the Lord has always been. He's the light. He is the wisdom that made the universe. He's the wisdom that gives the human mind the ability to understand anything. He was coming into the world, and yet the darkness doesn't understand His light. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we've seen His glory. This is where God is showing His glory in a human form, in a way that we can see what God is like translated into a human life. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. But God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, God, the only begotten, the Son of God, He's made Him known. That's what it means to reveal. Uh, Jesus has made God known. Now, again, let me remind you what I've just been saying. We need this Word made flesh to reveal to us more of God than we ever could have otherwise known. How do you know what God is like? When we look at the theophanies of the Bible, when God did reveal Himself, what happened? Well, when Ezekiel had a vision of God, Ezekiel lay prone on the ground for a week before he recovered. When Daniel had visions of heavenly glory, it took him three weeks to recover from it. When Moses was on Sinai, God said, No one can see my face and live. I'll put you in a cleft of the rock, and I'll make a bit of my glory pass by, and you can see my back, but no one can see my face and live. And so again and again and again, you have these pictures that a, a theophany is so overwhelming, so dazzling, that if God gives just a glimpse, it will annihilate, destroy those who see His glory. And even the holy angels, Isaiah has a vision, and when Isaiah sees the Lord in a vision, though again the temple is filled with smoke, so he doesn't really see Him, but... He says, I saw the Lord high and exalted. And he says there were seraphs with six wings. And with two of their wings, they're always covering their faces. These are great uh, heavenly beings, greater than anything the earth has ever seen or known. These great seraphs who live in the very presence of God, always praising God, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. They see His glory throughout the whole earth as well as in the heavens. But what do they do? When they're in God's presence, they always cover their faces with two of their wings. Even the seraphim cannot look on the glory of the living God. And so, how are mere people going to know God? How can God be revealed to us when a small glimpse of it can make a man sick unto death for three weeks and the holy seraphim can't bear to look upon him? Well, God can reveal himself in other ways as he did through Old Testament times, through his word and um, through theophanies and so on, but another way is for God to do it as, if you will, secretly. God is at work in everything. Providence is God's hand at work in all the things that happen in the world. And God works in a hidden way in all those events, but 
Very often providence is so mysterious and so hidden that you really can't see what God is up to. A lot of the time we're scratching our heads and we're saying, what in the world is going on? I just don't understand God's plan in this at all. And God speaks to us through conscience. And God's great mind is the thing that gives all of our minds any light at all. Jesus is the light that gives light to every man who comes into the world. But in a sense, that light is almost too subtle for us to notice, or too much everywhere for us to notice. God is running everything, and God is everywhere, and God is speaking in our conscience, but we say to our, of our conscience, well, is that really God, or is that just kind of an inner something, nudge that I feel regarding right and wrong? We know we have minds, but we say, well, did that mind just kind of randomly evolve? And so there's a sense in which God is almost too, uh, so big and yet so hidden that we, we're really not sure what he's up to. Um, one way, again, without being um, sacrilegious, think of being an ant living on the thumb of a giant 80 feet high. About all you'd ever know would be a little tiny, this area, and you'd never have perspective to see that you were actually living on the giant. And, and God is in some ways so big and yet so hidden that people say, well, I don't see any evidence that God exists. When everything is evidence that God exists, without him there would be nothing. You're saying, well, I, I can't think of any proof that there is a God. Your thinking is proof that there is a God. You would have no thoughts without the great mind that made the universe, but it's too big for you to know, and at the same time, too little for you to notice when it's going on inside you. And so God's revealing himself through kind of an inner light or through the events of the world is kind of too subtle, and yet when God comes, as he did sometimes in the Old Testament in those theophanies, it's too big and, and too overwhelming. How are we to know God? Well, maybe through a baby. Maybe through somebody who's just like us and can talk to us and can tell us what our father is like. Yeah, you ought to know your father, says Jesus. He looks after the sparrows. He's looking after you too. You, you have a, a human voice telling you exactly what God's up to and telling you exactly what your father is like. You have a human face and a human life to tell you what God is like. If you thought God didn't like sinners, well, Jesus tells stories about a lost coin, a lost sheep, a lost son, and the joy of having them back again. You want to know what God is like? You just listen to the voice of Jesus and, and look at the actions of Jesus, and all of a sudden, this God who's so big and so vast and so overwhelming, or who you fear might just be kind of a little voice inside you, he's not just a voice inside you. He's Jesus Christ, who's not just your conscience. He's the voice of God. And when people heard him, they were astonished because he talked like one who had authority. He was just another guy, just another peasant. But when he talked, he would say, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. And he would tell them exactly what God had been saying all along because he was the one who said it back then. And now he was going to come and tell it to them straight again. He's revealed God to us. Nobody knows God, but God, the one and only who's at the Father's side, tells us what's in the Father's heart. And he comes in human flesh with human voice to show us those things. Well, that alone would be enough to marvel at the incarnation and to rejoice in God, that he would reveal himself in ways that do not just fry us or overwhelm us or are too subtle for us, but that he comes to us exactly as a baby and a boy and a man whom people can see and hear and touch and listen to and learn exactly what God is like in a human form. He also became flesh to redeem. And when we ponder the mystery of why Jesus had to be God and human, the Athanasian Creed says, We believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. Fully God, fully human. Why? Well, the great theologian Anselm lived about a thousand years after Christ. He wrote a great book called Cur Deus Homo, Why the God-Man, or Why Did God Become Man? 
And in that, he explains what the scriptures tell us, that Jesus had to be human, and he had to be divine. He had to be fully and sinlessly human in order to be our representative. God needed a human being to obey perfectly. Adam represented us, but Adam blew it. And once our representative blew it, we were all in the same mess he was. We needed somebody who would live a perfect human life. I mean, we didn't need a seraph to live a perfect life. Seraphs are perfect. We didn't need God to live a perfect life. Uh, we do, but, but God just does have a perfect life. But it doesn't do us any good unless perfection is in a human representative of the race. And so Jesus had to obey as our representative so that all his goodness could be credited to us. And we needed a human to suffer as our substitute. God can't suffer in our place just as God. It has to be a human who's taking all the burdens of the human race upon himself. So we needed someone who's fully and sinlessly human. And we needed somebody who's fully divine because even if there were a perfect man, how could he bear all the sins of the world in a merely human nature? No mere human can carry such a load. And no mere human could unite us back to God. But because Jesus is God and humanity joined in one person, then humanity and God are brought back together again. And when we're connected with Christ in his humanity, we're also connected with the Lord God in his deity. The word became flesh to redeem. And that's why, too, he had to be born of a virgin. Because it was, in a sense, a do-over for the human race. God recreated humanity in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Without any of the taint of Adam and Eve's sin or any of the sin that had come since then, he made him a completely human being from the human nature of Mary, but without any of the sin that he would otherwise have inherited from the human race. The Word became flesh to redeem. The Bible speaks of this in many times, many different ways, Hebrews speaks of this very clearly. When Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. This is actually a prophecy from the Old Testament, which then Hebrews says is actually the voice of Christ himself speaking. He said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, those words of Jesus come from what theologians sometimes call the counsel of redemption. Even before Jesus came into the world as a human, while he was still the Word, the eternal second person of the Trinity, but not yet human, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit had a counsel of their plan to save and claim a humanity for themselves. And those are the words of Jesus, you've prepared a body for me. That's what's happening at the Incarnation that Jesus is going to come into the world, have a human nature and a human body that's prepared for him, and he's going to live that life and bear our sins in his body. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. He became human to redeem, to save us from sin. And he has his divine nature and his human nature, both of which are necessary to rescue the fallen human race. And the word redeem means to rescue by paying a price by paying a ransom. In one sense, he pays the ransom that God requires, a perfect human life, perfectly obedient, to be credited to us, and a perfect sacrifice offered to take away the punishment for sins. And so he redeems us from the curse that we brought upon ourselves. He redeems us from the wrath of God. But he also redeems us from the grip of Satan and from any claims that Satan has on us. Hebrews chapter 2 says that because the children have flesh and blood, that's us, we have flesh and blood, he too shared in the same, so that by his death he would destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. He took on a body that could die so that he would destroy the one who holds the power of death. Another verse, this one just comes straight from John again, the, the Apostle John, in the letter of 1 John. He says simply, the Son of God appeared in order to destroy the devil's work. He came to destroy the devil's work. He took on a human body to redeem the human race 
also from the tyranny and from the grip of the devil. To reveal and to redeem. Those are things that the Bible shows us and that are extremely important in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't even stop there. He became flesh to relate to us. And we think back to those days in the Garden of Eden when the Lord would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day and when they would fellowship with him and when they were naked in his presence and were not ashamed. It seemed a natural thing for them to just be there when God came in the garden. And then there was a day when God came in the garden and they were afraid and ashamed and they hid. And that was because sin had made them afraid and ashamed. And that's why ever since people can't just be in the presence of God without fear and without shame. And so God became flesh to relate to us in a way that would not frighten us, in a way that would make us no longer ashamed to be in his presence. The Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard told a story about a king who wanted to wed a maiden, but she was very poor and had a very low opinion of herself, and the king knew that if he came with all his wealth and all of his power and all of his riches, well, if he asked her to marry him, of, of course she would because he's the king and she has really no other choice if he shows up in all his power and majesty. But that is not what the king wants. The king wants a wife who relates to him at the very same level. And since she cannot be at his level, he goes to hers. And he becomes a peasant. And he lives near her to woo her and to win her love so that she will not love him for his throne, so that she will not love him for his wealth and for his majesty only, but she will love him because he loves her. And we have a great and loving God. And we would be mistaken if we looked only at the fact that God reveals his character to be adored and admired. That's true. Or that he came to redeem us and rescue us from our dreadful plight. That's true. But God is love. God is love. And he came to love and to be loved. He came to relate. And he wanted everybody to know that love. It would have been an enormous demotion and emptying of himself if the eternal God had come down and become emperor of the earth and had ruled from a throne and controlled every kingdom as a human being. This would have been an enormous come down for the Lord to be made merely the emperor of one planet in a human body when he is the one who brings out all the stars and calls them each by name to be mere emperor of the earth. That is nothing. Ah, but he did not come down just to be emperor of the earth. He came down to love the losers. It was really no much greater descent perhaps for him to become a peasant than it would have been to become an emperor, but he wanted the peasants to know of his love, not just the emperors. And he wanted the prostitutes to know that there was somebody who loved them and wasn't just after their body. He wanted the crooks and the lowlifes and the scumbags to know that though nearly everyone else despised them, he loved them. And so he became known as the friend of sinners. He lived in the armpit of Galilee, the town of Nazareth, where people said, can anything good come from that stuff? gummy place. He was born in a manger. He lived as a refugee for a few years in Egypt while his folks were on the run. He grew up in Nazareth. He, as an adult, didn't have any fixed address or place that he could call home. 
so that even the homeless would know that they are loved and anybody can relate to him. Yeah, emperors can be saved too. It's difficult. Rich people can be saved, though that's a little harder than getting in the poor and the losers. But even the emperors and the rich can be saved too because with God nothing is impossible. But the king wanted the maiden's love and not just her overwhelmed admiration or obedience. He came in human form to relate so that no longer do we say, ah, do I dare with my long pole to put it through that ring on the golden box? Do I dare to come into the presence of this holy one, this consuming fire? Well, we still should approach him with reverence and awe because our God still is a consuming fire. But he is also love. And he is also Jesus who's come and lived among us and became flesh to relate And finally, I want to emphasize he became flesh to remake us. When he came into the world, something happened. When the divine nature was united to the human nature, something happened that made it inevitable that death would be defeated and destroyed. The Apostle Peter said it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You know why? Because he was a human nature united to his divine nature. And He is the life, as John put it, the life appeared. And he remained the life even when they killed him, he was the life. And the life just is life. And darkness has no chance against light because the moment light shines again, darkness is gone. The moment life lives, death is defeated. And so the fact that the Son of God became human made the resurrection of Jesus Christ inevitable, unavoidable unstoppable because life, the God kind of life, cannot be defeated. And when he did that, he did something else. When he united himself to human nature, it meant not just that he would always remain glorified human, but when he came down to our level, does that mean, oh, now this God, he's really not such hot stuff anymore. He's not so glorious or splendid as he used to be and not so strong. (laughs) No, he never gave up even one bit of who he is as God. But what he did when he came down into humanity and emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant and suffering even the death of the cross, he lifted everything up. He put it all on his shoulders and raised it up to the throne of the universe. And he exalted human nature above all else. There is a human being on the throne of the universe. And all of humanity that is in Christ is exalted with him. God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 2 says it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. In putting everything in subjection to man... He left nothing outside his control. In the Garden of Eden, God came in the cool of the day and visited, and he will relate to us in even richer ways through the incarnate Son of God. But not only that, in the Garden of Eden, God appointed man to rule, and he left nothing that was not under him. We were to be rulers of creation on God's behalf And we blew it and became very bad rulers, and that's why creation is in many respects kind of a mess. But when we are how we're supposed to be, then creation will be put right as well. The whole creation groans as it waits for the sons of God to be revealed. That's what Romans 8 says. But it all depends on us being set right again. But when we are set right, the fact is that Jesus already has ascended in a human nature. And this means that our humanity is appointed to reign with him and to rule with him forever. To him who overcomes, I will give to sit with me on my throne. You know, we, we just read that stuff and we think, well, yeah, next verse. What? To sit with me on my throne? That's what Christ says. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge the angels? These are the kinds of staggering statements that the Bible makes, and how can it make such statements? 
because of this. Because there is a man on the throne of the universe. He has ascended and is exalted to the throne of the universe now, not simply as in his rightful position as God, but also as a man. Humanity has been affected by that. And that's why you sometimes wonder, well, why did God just not keep people all perfect in the first place? And then Jesus wouldn't have to go through all that stuff and bear all those burdens. Well, we shouldn't ask too many what-if questions because we can't understand those. But there was a point at which the theologian Augustine was thinking about the fall of man, and he started praising God, and he said, Oh, Felix culpa, oh, blessed fall. Because once the Son of God came into the world to redeem us and took on human nature, then we could never just be mere humans anymore. We were connected to the divine. Some of the early Christians would say God became man so that we would become like God. Of course, we're never, we remain human. We don't become divine, but there is another sense in which the Bible says we become partakers of the divine nature. And God knew before he ever made the world, before humanity ever fell, what he was figuring on. He was figuring on making physical bodily beings who would share in the reign of the universe and relate to him in love. It was not just plan B, a desperate rescue project that God said, oh, somebody's got to redeem those poor suckers, and so I'll, dirty job, somebody's got to do it, I'll take care of that. God never has a plan B. God knew from before the foundation of the world what he was going to do. And so it was not just to redeem, but it was also to relate and to remake humanity into something beyond anything Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. To reign with him on his throne forever and ever. I can't say for sure what all that means. And none of us can in this life. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It has not entered the mind to imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Though God has revealed at least something of it to us by his Holy Spirit. But it is the incarnation of the Son of God. It is God becoming man that we might become like God. That all of these things happened. And now... Well, now he's in the process, and the mansion is still kind of a mess. He's taken a rundown cottage, and he's cleaning it up a little bit, but he's also doing a major renovation project, which is a lot messier than just a little tidy cleanup job. He's making us fit to reign with him forever. And so we need some cleaning up, um, and Jesus has come to change our lives now. But he's also come not just to tidy us up into kind of decent, respectable little people again but to make us into something we cannot begin to fathom or imagine if it had not already happened in him. The one who was human and yet walked on water and commanded storms. The one who was human and died and yet rose again. The one who was human and yet reigns and lives forever and ever. This is what it means when it says the word became flesh and we've seen his glory and he has made God known and he has made us like God and he is transforming us. And he did all this. He did all this starting out in Eden where they walked with him in the cool of the day. And we walked out on him. And so instead of putting up with him in Eden, he went out into the desert. And he went out to where the thorns were growing. And the curse on Adam had come. And he took those thorns on his own head. And they were pressed into that very flesh that he had become. He took the thorns because we were too stupid to enjoy the garden. And he took the thorns not just to bring us back to the garden, but to bring us to the throne. Great indeed is the mystery of godliness. And we confess... Lord Christ, that who you are is beyond our imagination, and, but we thank you for your word which speaks to us of, of these things, and we thank you for your humanity and your deity, and Lord, fill us with joy at who you are, at what you have done, and may we ever be glad in you. We pray, Father, that as that light shines in the darkness, as you give 
the right to become children of God to those who believe in you. May this message, Lord, again, move people to faith, to trust, to believe what seems almost beyond belief, but yet has happened, that God has come to us in a human person, and that humanity is now exalted along with him. We pray, Father, that you will give us a sense of, of the glory of who we are becoming and of who you already are, that we may also, Lord, have the mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus, that though you were in the form of God, you didn't consider equality something to be grasped, but made yourself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And so, Lord, help us to think not only of our own interests, but also of the interests of others, to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but to think of ourselves soberly, to have, Lord, the mind of Christ being like-minded, one in spirit and purpose, that we may live for the joy of others, that we may do all we can to put ourselves in a position to love and, and to be loved, and that more and more the life of the incarnate Christ may be seen in us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.